Who is the most powerful villain in all of Dungeons and Dragons? Is it Vecna, the lich turned god? Or maybe Asmodeus, Lord of the Nine Hells? Or even Tiamat, archdevil turned god? Throughout Dungeons and Dragons lore, there are hundreds of incredibly powerful villains who could pretty much end your entire party with a snap of their fingers. All three of these names carry such weight in D&D and are all incredibly strong villains in their own right and could easily compete for the most powerful villain of all time, but I have another villain in mind that you've probably never heard of. And I'm of course speaking of Warlock the Shadow King. One of the oldest beings in all of Faerun, living for thousands of years beyond his natural lifespan, Larlock is one of the most powerful beings in all of D&D and has even had potential of ascending to godhood. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Born a human of the ancient majorcratic society of Nethro, Larlock quickly rose to power as the sorcerer king of the floating enclave of Jixter. Probably said that wrong, but he's important. Larlock was obsessed with learning as much as he could about magic and devoted most, if not all, of his time to research and development. Throughout his time as the ruler, he created powerful artifacts and continued his studies, eventually creating an artifact of immense power known as the Death Moon Orb. This orb eventually became known as a cursed artifact of domination, granting mind control powers as well as scrying and other necromantic abilities. Larlock used this artifact to bend enemies and allies to his will and ruled over Jixter for centuries. However, his time as the Sorcerer King was short-lived as the Netherese Empire would soon succumb to a cataclysmic event known as Karsis' Folly. This was a side effect of an incredibly powerful 12th level spell that led the Goddess of Magic to effectively ban all spells higher than 9th level from being cast. Also, the reason why you can't cast 10th level spells in your current edition of D&D. Barlock, being made aware of this potential cataclysmic event because of a contingency spell he used, was prepared and pretty much noped out of Jixter, flying away on his pal, a blue dragon, called that. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that, but that's his name. Anyways, the floating enclave of Jixter fell and the Netherese Empire effectively collapsed with Larlock being one of the last Arcanist kings of all of Nethro. And that pretty much sums up the history on Larlock. At least his human history, I suppose. It's not clear when in the timeline this happened, but eventually Larlock realized the lifespan of a human is not ideal for learning literally everything about magic and eventually turned to lichdom as a cure for his ailment. After Jixter fell, Larlock roamed the world in search of knowledge and eventually stumbled across the ruins of Orbidal, which used to be ruled by Larlock's longtime rival, Rahugla the Ageless. I probably pronounced that wrong, but I'm just going to say Rao. Like Larlock, Rao had become a lich and luckily survived the fall of his own enclave. However, this was unknown to Larlock as Rao had not been as well prepared and was effectively buried under the rubble of his fallen city. There, Rao waited until a savior appeared, which happened to be Larlock. Larlock went about exploring the ruins, content in his desire to learn more, completely unaware that Rao had survived. Eventually, Larlock had stumbled upon Rao, which made for an incredibly awkward conversation between the two of them, where Larlock pretty much said, Hey, this is... this is mine now. This meeting ultimately ended up in an epic spell-slinging battle between the two archliches. Larlock eventually won the battle and bound Rao to his will, making Rao the first lich to serve under Larlock. And I say the first lich to serve under Larlock because he actually has an army of liches. But we'll get to that. Once Larlock had bound Rao and claimed Orbital, he pretty much settled down in the ruins and eventually it became known as Larlock's Crypt. This became Larlock's main base of operations where he conducted all of his research and experiments as well as housed all of his undead minions. From there, Larlock amassed his undead forces and, well, really nothing, he just researched some more. Because of the nature of Larlock's studies, Larlock's Crypt eventually became known as the Warlock's Crypt, which Larlock really did not appreciate because he wasn't a warlock. So naturally, Larlock, hating this, did what any standard lich would do. Anyone that he realized was calling him a warlock would effectively be kidnapped in the night by his undead minions to be brought back to Larlock's crypt to be experimented on and eventually turned into an undead minion. Larlock did not do this himself, he simply sent out his minions and brought him back and said, Hey, don't do that, you're in trouble. <laughs> but surprisingly, the act of kidnapping those who insulted him, whether or not they really knew it or not, was the only real hand he played in the world around him. Larlock was completely content and honestly happy just sitting in his home, researching, conducting experiments, and rarely interacting with the outside world. 
That being said, there were times that Lorelock sent out minions to go capture creatures or sometimes humans to experiment on. But the majority of his research specimens actually came from adventurers who came to him to try and stop him. Lorelock put an end to those adventurers and used them to continue his research. However, the one thing that separated Lorelock from other liches was that he wasn't needlessly cruel. He often allowed captured adventurers the chance to earn their freedom again by completing the task for them. Granted, the task that they were given was generally very dangerous and required a curse to ensure that they would complete the task and not just run away. But if those individuals did complete their tasks, he would keep his word and then set them free as well as remove any curses or negative effects that he placed on them. While Larlock may be a lawful lich, it doesn't necessarily mean he isn't evil, right? Because, well, just to exemplify it, remember the army I mentioned earlier? The army of the liches? Well, Larlock got bored one day and just let them all free just to see what they would all do. That's right, literally over 200 liches all removed from his will and free to do as they pleased. And while that had an effect on the world, he never technically ordered them to do anything. It was more of an experiment just to watch what they would do. Those liches eventually went on to attack the Knights of Myth Draenor, but they were eventually defeated by the Knights as well as some of Mistra's followers. Mistra being the goddess of magic. Now, needless to say, the Knights were pretty pissed off since all the liches bore the mark of Lorlock, but he eventually showed up and just apologized for the hassle. He kind of acted like it wasn't a big deal. He just straight up walked up to them, or teleported up to them, and said, hey, I would never willingly battle those who do Mistra, this is just a misunderstanding. I freed them just to see what they would do. Larlock actually respected and had somewhat of a relationship with the goddess of magic herself. Remember when I said Larlock wanted to become a god? Well, that wasn't actually in spite of Mistra, but rather because there was pretty much just a vacancy in the spot. If you didn't know, Mistra or just the goddess of magic, has died multiple times over, and they've gone through so many variations, it is hard to keep track. Larlock attempted to become a god because the current god of magic was either dead or MIA, and honestly, I'm not entirely sure which. Larlock actually really respected Mistra and never acted against her and only really just desired for knowledge. So attempting to disrupt her would directly hinder his goal of learning everything he can about magic, so it's counterintuitive. The centuries Larlock had spent on researching magic would have been for nothing. Believe it or not, for an all-powerful Archlich, Larlock actually had a pretty level head. As far as their relationship is concerned, Larlock was effectively given a free pass for his research and the creation of spells and artifacts as long as he shared his findings with the goddess. Mistra literally forbade her clergy from interfering with him effectively giving Larlock the one and only free pass among all spellcasters in all of D&D history. In fact, Larlock is even partially responsible for her revival through the use of some of his magic items or creations known as blue flame items. Now, if you've watched our live game Behold This Crit, you might be picking up on certain words or verbs or names here, but just know that those things are completely different from actual D&D lore as I changed a lot of the information about them. The only thing identical between my lore and actual D&D lore is the blue flame item name and the fact that they are incredibly powerful magical artifacts. Okay, but back to the real D&D lore here. The blue flame items were said to hold not one, but three spirits of liches within each, as well as hold some of Mistra's own power within the items. And that's a single item, has power of Mistra and three liches! But alongside these blue flame items, Larlock also created other powerful artifacts like the previously mentioned Death Moon Orb and a necromantic ring known as Larlock's Soul Stealer. Not to mention the plethora of other powerful magical items that Larlock had in his possession. But with Lichdom, the one thing Larlock had more than anything was time. And over time, Larlock amassed an enormous wealth estimated at roughly 3 million gold to go with his collection of powerful magical artifacts. So at this point, if his arsenal of magical items, his relationships with the goddess of magic, or his literal army of liches weren't enough to convince you of Larlock's power yet, let's talk about his abilities. Larlock is just flat out immune to most forms of arcane magic, and what that means is he's effectively immune to any magic deriving from the weave, which, spoiler alert, is pretty much every spell in the game. Alongside, he has a bunch of contingencies that he has set on himself just in case he's ever truly threatened. 
He's so well versed in magic, he doesn't need components to cast spells, and is said to know every ancient Netherese spell and has the ability to cast epic magic. Epic magic, of course, is just a very, very distasteful name for incredibly powerful magics. For example, the spell Karsus' Avatar is an example of an epic Netherese spell. It is also a 12 level spell and the cause of the cataclysmic event Karsus' Folly, which eventually led to the death of Mistral, the goddess of magic at the time. Some other spells alongside Karsus' Avatar are things like Amovor's Soul Shatter or Proctiv's Move Mountain, which literally picked a mountain up and flipped it upside down. Or my personal favorite, Mavin's Create Volcano. Now, at this point, you might be a little confused and you might be saying, wait a minute, didn't Mistra ban all spells higher than ninth level? Well, yes, she did. But Mistra has also given Larlock a free pass to continue research and development of his incredibly powerful spells and artifacts, as I previously mentioned. So if that's the case, it wouldn't make sense for her to allow him to research and create these high level spells and then ban him from being able to cast them because obviously he can't conduct research that way. The fact that Larlock knows all of these incredibly powerful spells and is able to cast them puts him in a class above other villains in D&D. But I want to finish off with this. There are so many villains in D&D that no one is ever going to just agree about who is the most powerful. Vecna. Asrak, Larlock, all of those are incredibly powerful liches in their own right, and each of them had their own path to get to where they are currently. They each took part in different events throughout history, but honestly, you can't weigh one above the other. Could Larlock take Vecna in a 1v1? I can't honestly say yes or no. What I can say is that Vecna was technically defeated by mortals previously, so it would stand to reason that Larlock, with his vast knowledge, arsenal of magical items, and spellcasting ability, could also do the same. The bottom line is that these villains are all just different. While Larlock and Vecna are both liches, with Vecna eventually becoming a god, they are both practically polar opposites of when it comes to interacting with the world. Vecna, historically, is very, very noisy and makes sure everyone knows Vecna's coming to town. Larlock, on the other hand, is incredibly reserved and keeps his plans or research just hidden under lock and key. Rather than making a huge fuss, he operates quietly and effectively with his army of liches and just happily continues his research of epic level spells. Remember, Larlock hasn't become a god not because he can't, but because he doesn't want to. He just chills out by the fire, enjoying his studies, all the while laughing at Vecna for having to deal with all of his stupid whiny worshippers. Larlock doesn't want that. He just wants to study, do his own thing, and be left alone. And honestly, the popularity of Vecna and Larlock really exemplifies their characters. Everyone has heard of the big bad Vecna, but barely anyone knows who Larlock is. And that's how he likes it. And that's why I believe Larlock is the most powerful and dangerous villain in all of D&D. The last thing I want to leave you with is that D&D lore is messy, to say the least. And the information about Larlock is less than easy to find. So if you have questions or maybe think I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. I would really love to hear what you think about Larlock or how he would stand up to other popular villains that you think of. Also, if you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate it if you liked the video and maybe even subscribed if you liked the content enough. I post new videos every Monday and go live every Friday at 7.30 p.m. EST with our homebrew game set in the world of Sora. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you on Friday.